It's Health Pass 3. So today we have a special TAT seminar. It's the last one of the winter term, and we have a special guest, Peter Winkler. Uh, Winkler, uh, Peter is uh, William Morrill Professor of Mathematics and Computer Science at Dartmouth College. Uh, he uh, has more than 160 research papers and holds uh, many patents in marine navigation, cryptography, gaming, optic optical networking, and distributed computing. Uh, his research interests are in combinatorics, probability, theory of computing, um, he is a winner of the Mathematical Association of America's Lester Ford and David Robbins Prizes. Uh, Professor Winkler uh, has written three collections of mathematical puzzles. Um, th those are three uh, books uh, on mathematical puzzles and uh, he is uh, a frequent contributor to the National Museum of Mathematics in New York. Also. Uh, yeah, so today we have a pleasure to have uh, Professor Winkler as a speaker. Thank you, Kostya. Uh, let me first thank uh, everyone, including uh, <coughs> uh, Swami and Penny and, and Eva, who had a part in inviting me to this uh, very attractive place. And, and, and also, I want to apologize. Um, I'm slightly stiff from curling this morning. <laughs> so if I move slowly, <clears throat> I'll try to make up for it by talking much too fast. And uh, also, for those of you who may be in for some disappointment, this talk is actually not about distributing joints. OK, <laughs> so just want to make that clear. OK. so. So what is it about? Um, it's about what, what I think is a, is a fundamental problem in probability, but you could also think of it as a fundamental a problem in, in combinatorics or in graph theory or in optimal transportation even. Um, and we ran into it because we were interested in objects called permutons that I'll tell you, tell you a little bit more about. And then we discovered, at least we think we discovered, uh, that no one had, had, managed, had, had solved the problem, this so-called fundamental problem that we wanted to solve. Um, so we got derailed and, and tried to solve this problem. Now, in fact, our work is still in progress, and, and it's not completely solved, as you will see. Um, but we have some results, and, and we think it's interesting enough that maybe you'll enjoy it, so we'll see. OK, so here's the idea. You're given two probability distributions, mu and nu, and they could be discrete distributions, or we're going to consider also continuous distributions on the real line. And, <clears throat> and somebody gives us a set, which we could think of as being a subset of the plane. Okay. And we want to know whether this set can be the support of a probability distribution, a joint probability distribution, of two random variables whose own distributions are mu and nu. Okay. So another way of putting it is that if you have a, uh, a probability distribution on the plane, then it has marginals in the x direction and marginal distribution in the y direction. And so, and you want those marginals to be mu and nu. And you want the distribution to be concentrated on this set S that somebody gave you. And the question is, can you do it? Okay. So here's, here is a, a, a discrete version of the problem. You're given a set of row sums and a set of column sums for a matrix. And you want to find a matrix that has those row sums and those column sums. But there is a constraint. You want that matrix to be positive in certain places and zero in the rest of the places. Okay. And 
So answering that question is equivalent to asking this question, where you just think of the row sums as the, uh, as the values for the probability distribution mu and the column sums for the probability distribution nu. And uh, if they don't add up to one, it's not a big deal, but you want them to add up to the same thing, otherwise you have a hopeless problem. Okay. And the continuous version, um, well, it turns out that if mu and nu are continuous distributions on the real line, then we can change them into the uniform distribution on the unit interval and change the set accordingly. In other words, we can, we can reduce the problem to the case where the two marginal distributions are just the uniform probability distribution on the unit interval. Right? So imagine we have two such uniform random variables and we want to know what can the support of their joint distribution look like. Okay. Um, when, uh, in, for the case of discrete sets, the support of a probability distribution is just the pieces that have positive probability. Um, in the case of a conti continuous distribution, uh, it's the intersection of all closed sets of probability one. So it's just intuitively, it's, this is where the probability is. And can we have it anywhere we want? What are the constraints? Question. To the regular case? Yeah, like here, the oh, oh um, in a way you can, yes. Um, and uh, yeah, that's inter that might be interesting to you actually. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, what, is a, what is a permuton? I mentioned that we were interested in these things called permutons. And I want to tell you a little bit about permutons, partly because it was our motivation but mostly because I like to spread the word about permutons. They're cool things. Um, a permuton literally is just a probability distribution on the unit square with uniform marginals. Right? So it's nothing more than the joint distribution of two uniform random variables on 0, 1. Um, and uh, simple object, in fact, uh, it has other names. Uh, it's been called, before, before people who are dealing with permutations got interested in them. Um, these things are called two-dimensional copulas or sometimes uh, doubly stochastic distributions. Makes sense. Um, here's a picture of one. Um, this one is actually uh, a picture of, that describes random permutations that occur at a certain point in a random sorting network. Uh, as was proved by Duncan Deverne when he was a graduate student at UT. And uh, um, so this is, and, and the support of this distribution in this particular case happens to be this inscribed ellipse. Okay, so it's zero outside that ellipse in fact, when, if you look at pictures of permutons, you're not usually lucky enough to have a beautiful three-dimensional thing like that. First of all, it may not be such a nice picture. <laughs> um, so very often, all you, all you get to see of a permuton is the support, and you have to figure out what the rest of it might look like. Okay, so, uh, so for example, um, Here's a question we ran across. We wanted to know which sets were the support of a permuton. And here's eight sets. Um, so here's a quiz for you to think about, especially for those of you who've seen permutons before. Which of these eight sets, I'll give them uh, letters so you can write down some letters. Which of these eight sets can be the support of a permuton? Okay. And then at the end, we'll use our results to answer the question. That was too fast, probably, to, for you to answer that, but. <laughs> okay. Um, 
Okay, so, so what is a permuton for? What does it have to do with permutations? Well, um, permutons are limit objects for, perm for permutations. Some of you are familiar with graphons, which are a kind of limit object for, for dense graphs. Permutons function as limit objects for permutations. There is a natural topology that you could put on the class of all permuta of, of permutations of the numbers one through n, for all n. Okay. And this, uh, this turns the set of all permutations into a metric space. And the completion of that metric space is exactly the set of all permutons. Um, just the way the real numbers complete the rational numbers, permutons complete the permutations. And uh, okay. um, that means that we have to be able to think of a permutation also as a permuton, just the way we can think of a rational number also as a real number. And this is how you do it. Take the permutation 1, 5, 3, 2, 4, and we represent it by a matrix. Um, just so the permutation here is in one line notation. Right? What this really means is that the first position is 1, the second position is 5, the third position is 2. So that mapping from positions to numbers is the permutation. And we could draw it as a matrix here. And we could turn that matrix into a probability distribution this way. Um, we replace the ones by blocks of uh, uniform probability. And the blocks have to be height 5, so this thing adds up right. Um, so this is the permuton associated with that permutation. And uh, we call it gamma of 1, 5, 3, 2, 4. And in such a way, we get a permuton for every permutation. And now what we do is we apply what's called the weak star topology. Basically, it's just the L infinity metric on cumulative probability distributions gives us a metric on permutons. So two permutons are close to each other if they give about the same probability to any set. So the natural thing. And in that metric to, nice metric topology, they are exactly the completion of all the permutons. And what, what makes this really work great, OK, well, let me start. A permuton also is a mechanism for generating random permutations of any size you want. How do you do it? If somebody gives you a permuton, you pick, you make n drawings. It's a probability distribution. Just draw from it n times independently. And that gives you a bunch of points. And you order the x coordinates, you order the y coordinates, that gives you a permutation. And that's a random permutation generated by that permuton. Okay, so for example, if, if this vague looking thing is, is a, represents a, a permuton and we pick three points like this, then that actually represents the permutation two, three, one. Okay, just we middle up, down. Okay. So you could think of a permuton as a description of some class, some Real, literally a probability distribution, but like a class of permutations. And that what permutons are great for is you want to understand what a class of permutations looks like. You might be able to find a permuton that represents that class. So that picking points from the permuton is just like picking a permutation from your class. And there's a theorem which tells you how to do that, various versions. Okay. So, Suppose we have a class of permutations that cuts through all sizes of the symmetric group, right? So all sizes. And, um, and the, the class of all permutations of size n is size n factorial. A big class has n factorial divided by some exponential function. And uh, so a variational principle is this powerful tool which tells you that you can find out what that class looks like and how big it is by finding the permuton that has the desired properties and has the highest entropy. So this is a, this is a tool that can potentially solve many problems. 
And if you're interested in what large random things look like, and you need tools like this to do it, and permuton is your tool of choice so far for, for, uh, for, for permutations. And uh, there are various versions of, uh, <coughs> of these variational principles, which are more specifically called large deviation principles. Um, uh, the first three are about, about random permutations, and the last one is about random permutations which themselves are chosen from a permuton. Okay, so you, I, I devoted one slide here to what about counting of classes that are only exponential, right? So this stuff works when you have a big class that's n factorial divided by an exponential. But there are some famous classes of permutations, like the permutations that avoid a pattern, which are only exponential in size. Okay. And uh, for those guys, um, this large deviation principle doesn't work. The entropy is too crude a thing for them. So we actually devised a lower version of entropy, which we call catropy, and, uh, which we're working on. But so far, it doesn't work nearly as well. It's a little bit like the situation that some of you know about with uh, graphons, for dense, which work very well for dense graphs. Um, it's harder to get limit objects to work for uh, graphs which are sparse. But all right, that's, those are the breaks. OK. So let's go back to the problem. Okay. And let's start with a, the easiest case in the world, which is finite discrete distributions. Okay. And uh, okay. so again, we could think of the marginals as row and column sums. And we could also think of them as weights of the vertices of bipartite graphs. Right, so any bipartite graph you can represent by its adjacency matrix in which the rows represent the vertices on one side of the graph, and the columns represent the vertices on the other side of the graph. And uh, so here's an example. Where did those dots come from? Hmm. All right, anyway, sorry about that. <laughs> here's an example. Um, suppose we, that is our template matrix. So we want a matrix which is positive where that guy has ones. And we want it to have row sums one, uh, 0.5 and 4, and column sums 1, 2, and 1.5. OK, can we get it? Well, the claim is that's the same thing as asking the following question. Um, in this bipartite graph, is there a full nowhere zero flow from the left side of the graph to the right? Well, or from the right to the left, if you prefer. But let's say we go from left to right. Um, so what is a full flow? A full flow just means that it, uh, it, it takes all of the mass from the left, which is 4.5 units of mass, and moves it along the edges to all the mass on the right, which luckily is another 4.5. And, uh, and, and we know, actually, when we can do that, because we have this marvelous thing called max flow min cut, and very handy. And, uh, but the max flow min cut does not tell you one thing we wanted to know. We want this, our, our matrix, we want our solution to be actually positive where there are ones there, not just zero where there are zeros. So that means we need the flow not just to be full, but we need it to, to be present on every edge. We don't, want it to be, we don't want it to be zero on every edge. And for this max flow min, min cut won't work. Not, no condition about cuts is going to be able to answer this question for you. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So the graph question is: You're given a bipartite graph with weighted nodes. The, the weights on the left add up to the same as the weights on the right. We want to know: Is there a flow from left to right? That's a full flow and uses all the edges. Okay. Now. Um, so let's say capital X is the, represents the vertices on the left and capital Y on the right. And suppose we have a subset of the vertices on the left. Then 
fundamental condition you guys might know as Hall's condition tells you basically that the weight of the vertices on the right that are neighbors of the vertices on the left has got to be at least equal to the weight of the vertices on the left. Otherwise, there's, there has, there's no room to send the flow from U. Okay. So this is, in the case of Hall's marriage theorem, it's Hall's condition. Here we're asking for less than a matching. We're just asking for a flow. Okay. All right. So um, the condition is, again, for any subset of the vertices on the left, the neighborhood, the size of the neighborhood is at least that much on the right. And if we have that, we can get a full flow. Um, but we need, so here's an example, here's a neighborhood, and I've shown sort of schematically that it's supposed to expand as it goes to the, to the right. Okay. All right. Now, to get the nowhere zero flow, we need another condition which is not hard to figure out in which I'm sure is in the literature somewhere. Um, what you're worried about this, um, if you have a, a set on the x side whose neighborhood is just exactly the right size for it, right, then all of the flow from u has to go to n of u. And nobody else can send any flow to n of u. So if there's an edge back from the neighborhood of u, Here's a picture here. Here's u and n of u. This is a tight Hall set. Okay. If there's an edge that goes backwards from n of u to somewhere else, we're not going to be able to put any flow on that edge. All right. So this is a clear necessary condition to get this nowhere zero flow. And, uh, and the question is, OK, is it sufficient? Okay. And oh, by the way, yes, it's worth mentioning. I've been talking entirely about neighborhoods on the left expanding on the right. What about neighborhoods on the right? They have to expand to the left, right? But it turns out that these conditions are sort of crypto-symmetrical. Um, if, if you saying that U does, uh, expands going to the right is the same thing as saying that the complement of the neighborhood of U expands going to the left. Right. So these conditions are more symmetrical than they look. OK, so now um, you get an actual proof. OK, so I have to say, some of you know this, that in 1980 in Leibniz, Austria, I opened a meeting with a talk. And for some reasons which I cannot recover, I was motivated to say that a good math talk should have one proof and one joke. And I later added with the su suggestion of my friend Tom Trotter, it should be possible to distinguish which is which. <laughs> okay. So I'm telling you right now, this is supposed to be the proof. <laughs> okay. And uh, how does it go? Okay. And this, this really is going to be the basis for proofs that I will sketch, only sketch later on. Okay. Because they start to get a little bit more subtle. Um, okay. So. We have these two conditions that are necessary. It's useful to find a notion called the slack of a set, which is how much extra you get when you look at its neighborhood. The size of the neighborhood minus the size of the set. And uh, OK. So what we do in this finite case is we pick a number, epsilon, which is less than any non-zero slack. In fact, it's useful to make it less also than the weight of any vertex on either side of the graph some number which is smaller than anything else in the problem, basically, is all we're saying. Okay. And, and then what we do is we take any edge x, y, and we're going to shave epsilon off that edge. In this case, what does that mean? It means we cut down the weight of the vertex x at the left end by epsilon, cut down the weight of the vertex y at the right end by epsilon. Okay. And now we have a new problem. Okay, and uh, okay. So what we want to, what we observe is that because epsilon was less than any slack, that the new problem doesn't violate any Hall condition. So we get a full flow for the new problem. Now what do we do? Right. 
We just add epsilon back to get a full flow which actually has some value on that edge. Great. Um, and then what do we do? Yeah, we, just, we just repeat for every edge. So for every edge, there's a full flow that has something on that edge. Now just take the average of those flows and you've got something that's got flow on every edge. Okay. So pretty much a snap. Okay. Any questions about this? Okay, so this is going to be basically how we try to do this for, for uh, more interesting cases. Um, this theorem, as it is, is presumably out there somewhere. If you know where, I would love to get some references. Um, it may, in fact, be that my whole talk is in some 19th century paper. <laughs> if that's the case, don't tell me. <laughs> but decline to be my referee, please. <laughs> All right. Um, OK, just a remark that might be of interest to some, some of you. Um, as was asked a, a moment ago, um, we can, in some respects, well, it's, it's not so easy, but we can change this problem to one where all the weights of the vertices are the same. So you have n vertices on a graph on one side, n on the other, and they all have the same weight. Okay. Then you really do have a Hall's theorem, but you need every edge to be part of a matching, so you could put these matchings together to get a nowhere zero flow. Um, there is a, uh, um, a, an algorithm uh, called Synchron's algorithm, which some of you know about. Um, somebody gives you a matrix, and you want it to be doubly stochastic. That is, you want the row sums and the column sums all to be ones. Um, there's this remarkable algorithm, which is like the greatest algorithms is incredibly stupid, but it works incredibly well. <laughs> Just take, all, take each row and rescale it so it has, has, has row sum one. Okay. Now take every column and, re, and rescale every column so it has column sum one. Of course, that screws up the rows. So you do the rows again. Then you do the columns again, and you do the rows again. And this converges very rapidly under certain conditions to a doubly stochastic matrix, which has many nice properties that the original matrix had. Whoops. OK. It's, it's back. Good. <laughs> um, and uh, so but what, what you don't know from synchron in advance from Synchron's algorithm is which entries of your matrix is going to be zeroed out by the algorithm. And that's what our condition will tell you. OK. All right, what about the infinite discrete case? Okay. So now we have, say, two infinite discrete probability distributions. And we have the same necessary, we have these, these two conditions are still, still necessary here. Um, every set has to have a neighborhood that is at least as big. And if it's the same size, there can't be an edge going back to something else. Okay, but, um, if we try the same proof that you saw before, uh, there seems to be a problem here. Um, there may be sets with arbitrarily small slack. And then how do you get that epsilon subtracted off? In fact, this is a critical problem because if there really are sets with arbitrarily small slack that whose neighborhoods contain a vertex y and the sets themselves don't contain a vertex x, then we really won't be able to put any weight on the edge x, y, and we're doomed. Um, but what actually happens is the slack function is a submodular function, and submodular functions have nice properties, and, and one of them is that you can take, you could take unions of, you could take these sets that have, that's supposed to have diminishing slack, and take their unions and get something which is hall tight. And then that y to x thing gives you a counterexample to, the second, to our second condition. So that's how you start using the mechanism of these, of these things uh, to get it. Um, right. OK. So now there's a more general, we, we, we took a little step to the side here. We wanted to make a more general uh, combinatorial theorem. 
Very often when you see theorems about uh, flows, and ultimately this is about flows, um, there are capacities on the edges. Okay? So um, we, we try to prove the same, an, an equivalent theorem, should we say, when you're given not only weights on the vertices of your bipartite graph, but you're given capacities on the edges of your bipartite graph. Okay. And it turns out that everything works, but you have to change the definitions. Okay. So uh, how do you do it? Well, very briefly, um, you have a set U, and it might have a big neighborhood on the right, but it might be that the edges that take vertices in U over to its neighborhood have low capacity, so you can't use that whole neighborhood. So the part of the neighborhood that you can use, well, the size of that part is, uh, we use a subscript U to denote that. So for any particular vertex on the right-hand side, we use absolute value of that vertex sub U to mean the maximum of the size of that vertex and the sum of all the capacities of the edges going, coming from U on the other side. Now the Hall condition says that, uh, that for any neighborhood U, this interpretation of the size of the neighborhood has to be at least the size of U. That's pretty clear. And the, uh, and, and the condition going the other way is natural if you think about it for a couple of moments, although it looks a little kludgy. Um, it says that you're allowed to have edges from the neighborhood of U back to vertices that are not in U as long as they come up, they come from vertices all of whose capacity was not used. Right? If, if there's an edge that comes from a vertex whose capacity was used, that edge will, not, will never be able to carry any flow, so we're dead. <clears throat> so it's, again, easy to check that these things are, are necessary conditions. <clears throat> and now we go back through the proof. Now we need some more sophisticated things concerning submodularity, but everything goes through. You wouldn't want to see the, the makings of the sausage, but, um, but it goes through pretty well. Okay. All right, so how are we doing? Oh, not bad. All right, back to the continuous case. Now, um, so we've got a measurable closed set in a unit square. All right, so remember the, the, the support of a probability distribution is, is the intersection of all the closed sets of measure one. So it itself is always a closed set. So we have no chance of getting a set to be the support unless it's closed to begin with. And these are supposed to be Borel probability distributions, so it better be measurable. So it's, it's <clears throat> what you might call a nice set until you start to look at some examples <laughs> of measurable closed sets that are not all that nice. <laughs> but we'll start with this. Okay. And, um, okay. So the first theorem says that the whole condition works if you don't care about this nowhere zero flow business, okay? If you just want to know whether S contains the support of a permuton, then the whole condition works where you now actually measure the Lebesgue measure of a set in the x-axis. And then what do you do? You, you project that set up to your set S and then over to the right to the y-axis. That's the neighborhood. So I have a set U on the bottom and a set N of U along the side of your square. And that set N of U has to be at least as big as the set U, otherwise you're dead. Okay? And uh, proving this is done just in a pedestrian way of putting a grid, uh, putting a fine grid on the square, um, defining a, uh, a discrete version of a set S, showing that if S satisfies the whole condition, then the discrete version does. Then you use the discrete theorem that we just saw um, uh, to get a nowhere zero flow on this discrete set. We interpret that as a permuton. Um, and then as the grid gets finer and finer, we get a sequence of permutons 
Uh, and since the space of permutons is compact, we get a limit, and we prove that the limit has the desired properties. This is all, this is pretty standard stuff for, uh, which sadly does not always work, but when it works, the first thing you try, if you have a discrete theorem and you want to prove a continuous version. Okay, yes? Uh, the big measure, yes. So it's, if it's just one line, it's... Uh... It's a measurable set, oh yeah. So in fact, um, yeah, in fact, there's a permuton called the identity permuton whose support is exactly the diagonal line from 0, 0 to 1, 1. That represents only one permutation, the identity permutation. It's measure zero, but it's measurable. Okay, so any set of measure zero. Sets of measure zero, fine, yeah, 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 yeah. But, they, but if, if your intuition is that they cause problems, your intuition is good. <laughs> okay. Um, but no matter how ridiculous the set looks, if it satisfies the Hall condition, then there is a permuton uh, whose support is inside the set doesn't tell us whether there's a permuton which the support is exactly the set. Okay, and uh, okay. Now, here we get to the problem that uh, permutons can be pretty wild. You know, I have to say, it's, it's puzzling to me that permutons can be so wild. And permutations are so innocent. Right? I mean, it's a permutation from one to n. It's just the string of numbers from one to n. It's an ordering of the numbers from one to n. So you have some wild permuton, but because permutons are, in fact, the closure of a set of all permutations, that means there's, there's a sequence of these innocent-looking permutations that approaches that ridiculous wild permuton in some fashion. And there's no way to see this by looking at a sequence of innocent-looking permutations. So this is a mysterious fact to me. Um, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the major first paper that showed that permutons really are the closure of the class of permutations was by five Brazilian mathematicians whom I couldn't name, I just called them the Brazilians, but, and a uh, marvelous paper. And um, they, they did it, they, they proved the theorem first using uh, a, uh, a permutation version of the Semerity regularity lemma due to uh, Josh Cooper. Um, but that they, then for the actual paper that you see uh, uh, that was published, they found a, 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 a more direct way to prove it. But the fact that, that you can represent per large permutations by these permutons is really a lot like how the Semerity regularity lemma works. Let me just explain that for one second because it's worth saying. When we, when we make a random permutation from a permuton, right, we just pick random points from this probability distribution and we, and, uh, and we look at how they line up, okay? Now, above every x on the x-axis, there is a, uh, there's a marginal uh, distribution. And so basically, if you pick x on the x-axis, you're then pick, picking a random y, right? You're just deciding, for example, if this is your first x, this is what will be in the first position of your permutation. And that will be independent for every x that you choose. So you, basically, when you pick permutations from a permuton, you're choosing permutations where the values of this function that represents this permutation are chosen independently. Okay? Now that is far from the case if you just write down some list of permutations or any, any old probability distribution on permutations. You expect these things to be strongly correlated. You expect that if you pick this value for x then you, have, then you need that value for x2 or something. So the fact that you, these permutons are limits of permutations says that somehow in the limit 
these random permutations behave sort of like their coordinates are independent. Okay, it's, you can see, I'm still amazed by this. It's been out for years now. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Now, um, what theorem did we get? Well, let's consider the case where S is a regular closed set. Okay. So a regular closed set is what I usually imagine when somebody says, oh, let us be a closed set. Uh, it's a set which has body and it has a boundary. Okay? And the body part is the interior of the set. And the boundary is the closure of the interior. That's the definition of a regular set. In general, a regular set is a set which is included in the closure of its interior. And if it's a closed set, like RS is, it just means the set is equal to the closure of its interior. And uh, which, for example, the diagonal line from 0, 0 to 1, 1 is not because its interior is empty and the closure of the empty set is the empty set. But you could also have sets which have some interior, but then they have lines running off in random directions um, that aren't part of the closure of the interior and then they're not regular. Okay, so that's what a regular set is. And the permutons that arise when you maximize entropy um, seem to be ones that have regular support. So this was a particular interesting case to us. And here we were able to show that the equivalent of the discrete conditions we gave before is sufficient as well as necessary. Okay, so what is the condition now? Um, it says that uh, it, it must it must be the case that for any u in the x-axis that the neighborhood of u is at least the size of u by ordinary Lebesgue measure. But also, if they're equal, then they must be equal coming back. Okay? If u is tight, so its neighborhood is the same size, then the neighborhood of the neighborhood must again be the same size going back to the x-axis. Okay? So this again is an easy, sufficient condition and um, proving it was, uh, excuse me, these necessary condition, proving it was sufficient uh, took us, I don't want to say long, but, <laughs> um, but I want to tell you what the key idea was because who knows, maybe you can use this key idea. Okay, um, all right. So the general approach is not so different from the proof that you actually saw. Okay, so Take a, a, take a cell, for us a cell is a dyadic square, but it doesn't really matter um, as long as you have sets of squares of all sizes available um, and only countably many of them so you can deal with them. Then you can take a cell which is inside the, uh, the set S, okay, and now we want to show that there is a permuton, okay, uh, which is supported inside S and which has some mass on the cell C. Okay. Now, that is going to be sufficient to get a permuton which is supported on the whole set S. And for that, in this case, you need a, a, a little topological argument. In order to be supported on the set S, what do you need to do? You need to show that every point in the interior of S has arbitrarily small neighborhoods of positive probability in the permuton. Okay? If you can do that, it shows that the support of your permuton contains the interior of your set. But the, so the actual support is the closure of the interior of the set because the set is regular you actually are supported on the entire set S. So, so now we've reduced the problem to getting the permuton supported inside S with mass on the cell C. Okay? Now we know what we need to get a permuton supported inside, uh, inside S. We need to satisfy the Hall condition. And then we're done. Okay? 
So the idea is, okay, before we just shaved off epsilon from that edge, right? So this time, the idea, we shave off something from the marginals of the, of the cell C, okay? Now we have a new problem, but the new problem doesn't have uniform marginals anymore, okay? So it, its marginals have a dent where the cell C was. The cell C is maybe, think of it as I by J. And uh, so I is a subset of the x-axis. And we're going to make a dent on the marginal there, and a dent on the marginal for J. And that, and, but we can apply, because of, by reduction, we can apply the old rule. But now when we apply the whole condition, we have to be careful to use the new dented marginals. We don't use the word dented in the paper. I just invented that, but it's just, maybe it's as good as anything. Okay, now, uh, so that sounds fine. And the first thing we tried to do was cut off a, uh, a very small constant amount from the marginals, right? So the marginal on I, instead of being, instead of having density one for a Lebesgue measure, it has density one minus epsilon. That doesn't work. The trouble is there could be sets around with small slack that, that can reduce the density of the marginals on I and J to something arbitrarily small. Um, so the idea still works, but instead of removing a fixed amount from the density on I and on J, we have to remove a, a, a probability distribution, which may have zero density at some points but is overall non-trivial. Then we move that from I and we move something similar from J. Then we find a probability distribution on the cell that has those marginals. Okay. And that's what we add back later to our permuton that had positive mass on C. Okay. All right. Um, I think I said that wrong. I'll say it right in a minute. OK. All right, so here's the idea again. We want to find sub-distributions. So these are not probability distributions, but they're measures with positive measure, which uh, is going to be generally much less than, than the length of i or the length of j. And, uh, OK. And then, then we're going to extract those from the marginals, satisfy the whole condition, Get a get get a not a permuton exactly because it has these strange marginals, but we get this thing, this probability joint probability distribution, and then we add back something on C to get a permuton that has mass on C. Okay, so what's the key to doing this? That very often there's one sort of key definition that makes a proof work, and uh, and this is the key definition here. It's something called torque. Now, we had this notion of slack. And torque is sort of complementary to slack, but, or dual to slack, but not exactly. It involves Lebesgue measure in a funny way. Okay. Um, suppose we want to define this, uh, this sub-measure. I call it on J. Um, and, uh, we have a, so we have some subset of J called capital A. And we want to define an, something on capital A which would be smaller than any slack that involves A in some way. So that at the end of the proof, we could subtract this thing off and not ruin the whole condition. And, and the, the notion that works is, um, is take the infimum over all sets in X with the interval I excluded um, of the slack of the set plus the measure of a part of A that's not covered by the neighborhood of the set. Okay? Now, I'm, I'm used to this by now, but I think I can imagine that 
this looks like a kind of a mysterious definition. But it has two great properties that we need both of. And it, this is exactly the thing that has these properties. One property is it undercuts slack in a way which will enable us to do, it, do what we want with it. And the other property is that this thing is also submodular. Okay, so now is the time, maybe good time to remind you what submodular is. Um, okay, a, uh, a set function is submodular if for any two sets, A and B, the value of the set on A union B plus the value of the set on A intersection B is no greater than the value on A plus the value on B. Okay. Now this condition shows up, well, I mean this is the department of C and O, so I know a lot of you guys have seen this condition show up before. Um, it's a very important property, and it's equivalent intuitively to the property of diminishing returns. It, it, it's equivalent to saying that uh, the amount this function gains by adding some elements of the universe to it gets smaller and smaller as the set you're adding it to gets bigger and bigger. Okay. So it's a natural condition if, if, if the measure of a set is somehow how badly you need it. Right? The more you have, the less badly you need something else. We know that that theory does not work in practice, but it's a nice mathematical abstraction. Okay, now it turns out, um, okay, that submodular functions have this property that we didn't know about at first, um, but they hide probability distributions underneath them, which means that they should probably be called supermodular functions um, by analogy with super martingales. All right, don't worry about that. Um, all right. So it says that if, if you have a, uh, a, a non-negative submodular function, um, then there is a probability distribution on, on the system of sets um, where the probability measure of the whole set is the same as the function value of the whole set. And the probability measure on any subset is bounded by the submodular function, in our case, the torque. Okay. So what we can do, so this is something which you will find in uh, Lovas's big survey article on uh, submodular functions and convex sets or something like that. Do I have the name right? Um, in the discrete case. Um, uh, again, we don't know the literature of continuous probability well enough to know whether we can find this theorem in this form, uh, such a case, but, it, but we could prove it from the, from the discrete case, so who cares, okay. Um, and that gives us the thing, okay, yeah. That gives us bit, finally the proof. We compute these distributions on I and we compute them on J. We find a distribution on the cell which has these marginals. It's not hard. And that's what we add on to the permuton we got after we took off, after we dented the marginals. And finally, we have the theorem. Okay, so let's try to apply it to these guys. Uh, so uh, only four of these guys are actually regular sets, but the ones that are not, um, let's see. What do I do? Yeah, okay, I got it. Oh, I know what I must have done. I pressed the blank oh, screen. No, it's, it's, it's a connection. It's a connection? Okay, all right. Hmm, yeah, because I didn't do anything that time. Okay. Um, all right, so now let's look at the, at the pictures again. Um, <clears throat> The, uh, the empty circle um, fails the second necessary condition. Um, there are tight sets which don't reflect back the tight sets. So it flunks and it's no good. But the, but the full inscribed circle 
This you, probably, you might have guessed works because the ellipse worked. Okay. And uh, in fact, that's a really nice permuton. You get that permuton by taking the uniform distribution on a sphere, and then which by Archimedes' theorem has uniform marginals when projected down to the square. It's very nice. Um, the situation for the, uh, okay, so, yeah, so that's no good, that one's good. The situation for the diamond um, is the reverse. Um, this guy has, has continuum many solutions. There are loads of ways to make permutan than the diamond. But none of those ways has any mass anywhere in the center of the, of the square. So this guy, in particular, that guy fails. Again, it doesn't satisfy the second condition. Okay, uh, this guy fails the whole condition. This guy satisfies it with slack to spare, and you don't need to worry about the second condition if all if you have slack to spare everywhere. And uh, therefore, although we may not know what the permuton is, we know that there is one without support. Yes. D is, yes, only, only the sets that with, with the gray, prop, gray ones are regular. But we have, remember, we have two theorems to play with, plus we can find our own permutons. So, so with what we have, we can do all these cases. Always easy. Yeah. Um, OK. And, and this is, again, a question of checking the whole condition. Checking the whole condition when you've got curves like this uh, amounts to checking derivatives. You need to have certain derivative properties. Okay, so yeah, so the uh, the narrow guy works. The fat guy is out. Um, what's, yeah, um, let me before I wrap up do the wrap up slide. Let me just say that um, there's more to do. Um, it looks like we can now do the case where the set S. Uh, consists of a bunch of curves uh, that are not too close to each other. Um, but there are, there are lots of other things out there. There's a Cantor permuton. I'll let you try to figure out how this is described. There, there are permutons which have the property that uh, um, the support S is a union of diagonal lines, none of which has any weight. Okay, um, uh, but the set has no interior. Um, so there's, there's some crazy stuff out there, and, uh, and maybe um, we can wrap this up for all cases. And uh, the, the last part will be, what about distributions that are partly discrete and partly continuous? Um, you know, so that's kind of a world. But we're having a lot of fun, and. Uh, we hope you will at least enjoy this, and in some cases can use this part. Okay, this is a nice permutation. I'll tell you about it if you ask. So we have time for questions, but please don't ask questions until the next thing there is a microphone. So just let me know if you have a question that are right here. There's a question from Pink Shirt in the back as well. Uh, what, can, what can you say about permutation statistics, like longer cycle length and so on? How much of that is preserved? Yeah, um, it depends on what statistics you want. Um, some stati uh, cycle length and, and, and uh, presence of cycles of certain lengths are not continuous in this topology. And therefore, um, you can't read off a value. For example, the simplest case is um, somebody gives you a permuton, doesn't have a fixed point. Well, the answer is that it comes with a distribution on fixed points, but it doesn't have, it doesn't specifically have a fixed point. Okay. And, uh, but there are other th things involving uh, patterns are, work wonderfully. Um, yes, uh, wait, but... Okay. Yeah, once more. Um, yeah, yeah, 
Let me go back to it. I don't think that was too far ago. Yeah, here it is. So S contains the support, contains the support of a permuton. Exactly. Ah, okay, okay. Right. you got it right on the nose. <laughs> okay, good. My question's a bit simpler. So these permutons come from, you have a, you, you, you put a topology on these permutation matrices and then you have these limiting, can you just say again, I think you said it, but what was the topology you put on and what does what it is look it like yes. between the two permutations? I, I said, actually I didn't say, you caught me out. I said what topology, ultimately ends up being on the permutons themselves. Yeah. Um, the topology on the, uh, uh, on the permutations is, is a topology, is a pattern density topology. It works like this. Um, you give me a pattern, say, one, two. A pattern is just some small permutation, okay? And what I do is I, I, I pick ran, two random places in, in the, in the one line description of the permutation. And I look at the values, are they ordered like one, two, or are they ordered like two, one? And the fraction of them that are ordered like one, two is called the one, two density of the permutation. And if we're dealing with patterns of length k instead of patterns of length two, then of course they're k factorial patterns. And and you will get a probability distribution on those patterns from any large permutation or from any permuton. From a permuton, you get it by taking a big integral. And, uh, but two permutations are close if their pattern densities are close for small patterns. Okay? So if you want an actual metric, you could do something like this. You could take half the total variation distance between their patterns of length two plus a quarter of the total variation distance of their patterns of length three plus an eighth from the patterns of length four. That gives you a nice, there, there are innumerably many other um, metrics that work. And uh, yeah, so that's what you, if you have a particular statistic in mind that you want to study for. Uh, so generally speaking, Algebraic things don't work as well. Um, you know, we all have different ways of thinking about permutations. Some of us think of them more like random functions. Some of us more like random orderings, which is what I do. Some of us like elements of a group, a symmetric group. Um, and uh, the group point of view is not as useful here. So I have two questions. Um, so yes, for the for the discrete case, and maybe this is just another way of getting a nowhere zero flow, that uh, it seems to me like your condition is basically, another way of saying it is that, so you want the right min cut in your graph, but if you delete an edge, the min cut should go down, right? I mean, that, that should be really the, the condition for a nowhere zero flow. So, but with that condition, basically, any f if you have that condition, any flow should actually be a nowhere zero flow, if it satisfies that. So I right, so this, this, so this can't be quite right, yes. Um, yeah, I, I think if you, if you try to write down a condition in terms of cuts, you can't do it. Um, you can give examples where the cuts behave the same, but one of them has a nowhere zero flow and the other one doesn't. Okay, maybe we should I, I haven't, discuss. I, haven't, I, I have to confess, I haven't looked at it for a while. Okay, um, we, we can talk offline. But yeah, let's, let's talk offline. Yeah. Okay, yeah. And, and the second together. question is, uh, what's the joke in your talk? Oh, the joke, oh yeah. Oh. All right, here's one that, that uh, is, sometimes that happens. Yeah. <laughs> Matt, do you guys know the story of the pure mathematician? Okay, I like this story. It's very credible. <laughs> A pure mathematician is walking down the hall of, of her department, which might look like one of your confusing halls and... and uh, and CM building here. And, uh, and she herself is, wrote her thesis originally in algebraic topology, and then she got interested in topological algebra, and then geometric algebra, and now she's doing algebraic geometry and K-theory. 
And, and uh, she's looking at the names of her colleagues on the doors. And here's one who's doing applications in computer science, and this one's doing applications in engineering, and this one is doing genomics, and this one is doing economics. And she's thinking to herself, boy, you know, you know, I can understand the attraction for doing stuff that's going to make a difference in people's lives while you're still alive. But I guess that, you know, I'm in mid-career now. I'm a pure mathematician. I've got to face it. That's what I do. And just at that moment, the door of the seminar room, this room, the door of the seminar room opens a crack, and somebody hangs a sign on the door that says, Lecture on gears begins now. So our mathematician friend stands there and thinks, my God, it's, it's like a sign from the heavens or something like that. It's like I'm being dared. Do I, turn my, do I change everything? Do I, do I even think about it? Stands there for a minute, thinks about it, and then she says, I'm going to do it. And she walks into the lecture room and sits down. And the speaker's first words are, <clears throat> the theory of gears with a real number of teeth is well understood. <laughs> all right. <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you all for listening to me and, uh, um, and for inviting me. This is great. <laughs>